Good evening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are present with your church. You know our each and every circumstance. Give us ears to hear what you would teach us. Amen. Well, anticipation builds as the day draws near. It's a sport event you've been waiting for all year. The final of the Rugby World Cup. It all comes down to this one day. Springboks versus All Blacks. Who will be crowned champion? But there's a problem. You can't watch the match live. You have to take your kids to a birthday party. Study for your final exams. Rush your wife to hospital to have a baby. Stage six, load shedding hits. We don't want to miss the final, so you make a plan. Uh, you set PVR on your DSTV. Uh, you buy uh, chips and popcorn and beer and bultong and chocolate. Uh, you make sure to switch off all the notifications on your phone. You don't check your social media just in case someone posts something about the result. You tell your friends and your family not to say anything. You sit back on your couch surrounded by your feast. Turn on the TV and a news announcer blurts out, Go Boca! We've all had moments like that. Uh, when we didn't know, we want to know the result of something and someone spoiled it for us. But sometimes the opposite is true too. We don't know the result, but we really would like to. You write an exam. Well, have you passed? It seems to take forever to the, for the examiner to mark your paper. You have a job interview. What well, did you get it? Can you celebrate? You go for a scan. Well, the wait to hear back from the doctor is torture. Is it malignant or not? Well, sometimes we wish that we could look into the future to know what's up ahead. But what we might wish for actually happens to John. And we come across John often in the Bible. Uh, him and his brother James are the children of Zebedee the fisherman. They're nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Uh, which is a pretty cool name, eat your heart out Thor. <laughs> and in the New Testament, John writes the gospel named after him. He writes the books of 1, 2, and 3, John, which we're working through in our life groups at the moment, as well as the book of Revelation. And it's in the book of Revelation that John records two visions he has while on the island of Patmos. Well, Patmos is a Greek island uh, that lies off the west coast of modern-day Turkey. In 2009, Forbes magazine a name, Patmos, Europe's most idyllic place to live. Well, that certainly wasn't the case when John lived there. Uh, Patmos was a rocky, desolate island, the Robben Island of the Roman Empire. And John finds himself on the inhospitable island as a result of preaching the gospel. The Roman authorities took exception to his ministry in Asia and deported him to Patmos. Now, such persecution was common in the early church which is why John calls himself a brother and a partner in the tribulation. He's writing to others who are suffering just like he is. Now imagine being a Christian in John's day. Rome is approaching the peak of their power. By 117 AD, their rule will extend over what is now Albania, Algeria, Andorra, Armenia, Austria, Azerbaijan, Belgium, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, England, Egypt, France, Georgia, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Iraq, Israel, Italy, Jordan, Lebanon, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Libya, Malta, Monaco, Morocco, Netherlands, North Macedonia, Portugal, Romania, San Marino, Saudi Arabia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, Sudan, Switzerland, Syria, Tunisia, Turkey, Vatican City, Wales, and Yugoslavia. <laughs> That's a vast empire. And despite what we see in the Asterix and Obelix comics, you know, Roman soldiers weren't to be toyed with. Everywhere that you looked, there were signs of Roman power and authority. Soldiers, standards with eagles on top of them. Magnificent architecture, which we copy to this very day. And a host of temples to a pantheon of gods. Well, the Romans would bring the children of conquered nations to Rome because they knew that they'd be overwhelmed and won over to the Roman culture. The power and the pomp of Rome were both intimidating and enticing. Well, against the might of Rome, well, Christians would have felt powerless and afraid. And then there was the constant threat of persecution. If only someone could comfort them in their trial. If only someone could look into the future and tell them that everything was going to be okay. Which is exactly what John does. While on Patmos, 
uh, God gives John a revelation. John records what he sees and what he hears in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation can be a scary book, it's full of uh, stuff we find difficult to understand, and it, can, it contains all sorts of weird symbols and imagery. And that's because Revelation is written in a particular genre. So let's see how well you know your genres. I'm going to show you a picture, and you tell me what genre of movie it is. Got it? Western, cool. Sci-fi, good. Uh, I'm too scary, so you sleep tonight. Musical, okay, that's it. Sorry, you've got only four. Uh, we're very familiar with these genres, but less so with apocalyptic, which is the genre that Revelation is written in. But read the Old Testament books of Daniel and Ezekiel, and you'll see much of the same imagery used there. Now, the key feature of apocalyptic literature is that it gives us God's perspective on history. It shows us the world that we live in, but from a divine point of view. And what John sees is a vision of Jesus in all his resurrection glory. Well, Jesus is described in language that is used only of God. Now, this isn't Jesus meek and mild. This is Jesus the King. Awesome, powerful, majestic, dazzling, breathtaking. So much so that when John sees this Jesus, well, he falls down in absolute terror. Well, John doesn't fear Rome. I mean, yes, they're powerful. Yes, they persecute Christians. But Rome pales in, in, into, into insignificance in the light of Jesus. All the empire's power and all their might is nothing when compared to the ruler of the universe. Now, John doesn't fall to his knees in front of the emperor. He falls at the feet of the risen Jesus. The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who ultimately will decide our eternal destinies, who holds the keys to, key, uh, to death and to life. Now, Rome may persecute you, they might even kill you. But Jesus, well, he holds the keys that matter. Imprisonment and death hold no fear for those who belong to Jesus. Because no matter what we endure in this life, well, Jesus has given us the promise of eternal life. But Jesus isn't alone in his vision. He's standing in the midst of seven lampstands. Well, these are the seven churches who John is writing to. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Well, in John's day, in the Roman province of Asia, now Turkey. Well, the message is clear. Jesus is standing in the midst of his churches which is to say that Jesus is with his church. What could be more encouraging to John and his readers than that? In the face of persecution and tribulation, and the might of the Roman Empire, well, Jesus is with you. He's watching over you. It's him who has control over life and death. It's him who will decide your eternal fate. And so you don't need to fear, not even death, because Jesus has got this. When Christian missionaries were thrown out of China, under Chairman Mao, well, many fear that it would be the end of the church. But the church in China has grown stronger than ever. For a while, it looked as if the Soviet states would eradicate the church. But the communist regime, well, they've gone, and the church marches on. Today in the West, it seems as if liberalism and secularism might send the church into oblivion. In other part of the, parts of the world, the threat is Islam. But the risen Jesus will build his church he stands in their midst. He guards and he guides his church. So that even when things seem at their worst, we can be sure that we're not abandoned. We can patiently endure, knowing that it's the risen, exalted Jesus who stands with his church. In the face of persecution and trials, we need not fear. As one old song goes, I've read the back of the book and we win. Well, Jesus will be with his church. But the question is, well, will his church be with him? And so in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, seven churches are addressed directly. Now, these aren't the only churches in Asia. They're selected as representatives of all the churches. Well, we know this because there are seven of them. And in Revelation, the number seven plays an important role. It's the number of completeness. And so these letters were written to specific churches at a specific time. 
They were relevant for whatever issues the church was facing, uh, but they were also written for every church in every age, which means they have as much to say to St. Stephen's Church Claremont in 2023 as they did to the church in Ephesus in the first century AD. And so with that background in mind, let's look at our first church, the church at Ephesus. Let me read it again for us. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, who is this angel? Yeah, well, we don't know. <laughs> An angel is simply a messenger in the Bible. Uh, so this could be a human messenger. Perhaps it's the leader of the local church or the human messenger who took the original copy of Revelation uh, to each church. On the other hand, it might be a literal angel. But these are all just best guesses. The truth is that we don't actually know. But what's important isn't the angel, but the message that they receive from Jesus. And so let's read what that message is. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, but you, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not... I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him who hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Well, Ephesus was a busy port city. A wide road uh, lined with columns on both sides ran down from the city to the port, down to the harbor. Well, as the gateway to Asia and beyond, it was a major center of commerce. According to one early historian, it was second in importance and size only to Rome. Well, the city boasted many famous buildings, including a library, public baths, and a theater that seated 25,000 people. But the pride of the city was the massive temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world, the ancient equivalent of our bucket list. Well, Artemis was the goddess of the hunt and wild animals. She was also a fertility goddess. So there's a picture of one of her statues. Now scholars disagree as to what those strange lumps are around her body. Some think they're eggs, others female breasts, and still others, well, they think they're the testicles of a bull. Now don't lie awake all night wondering. Okay? It's not important. Okay? What matters is that it had something to do with fertility. If you wanted children, if you wanted abundance, well, this was your go-to goddess. The temple also offered asylum to criminals. And so it became a center for organized crime and for lax morals. And on top of all this, well, Roman emperors had declared themselves gods, which meant they demanded worship. This meant participating in festivals honoring the emperor, offering incense on altars when entering the city and recognizing the authority of the emperor when conducting business, uh, when shopping in the market, or even drawing water from a public fountain where the emperor had to be acknowledged as the provider of life. All of, meant, all of which meant that life was difficult in Ephesus for Christians. So how did they fare? Well, very well, it seems. In the face of opposition, well, Jesus commends them for their works, their toil and patient endurance, for their sound doctrine and their refusal to be persuaded by false teachers. Now, this is a church where a lot is going on. They run three services on a Sunday. There's a kids' club and a youth ministry, family camp, men's breakfasts, there's women's breakfasts, holiday club, Christianity Explored, prayer and puddings, life groups. The church teaches in the local school. They support a homeless ministry. They're involved in various camps throughout the year. They're in partnership with missionaries. They run electives for members to grow in specific areas of their faith. And this church is busy, full of activities and programs, and its members work hard. And to toil is to labor to the point of exhaustion. Now, this is no Sunday evening only crowd. They were active, actively serving at great personal uh, sacrifice and expense. They'd come in the morning to help out at creche. They'd commit to a life group one night a week and give up their Friday evenings to teach youth. Well, Jesus applauds their efforts. 
He knows everything that they're doing. But not only are they working hard, well, they're also patiently enduring. Now, being a Christian isn't easy. Well, schools in America have something called Spirit Week. Students are encouraged to dress according to different themes each day. The idea is to promote school unity and school spirit. Now, one public school, one of the themes was Transgender Day. Kids were encouraged to wear rainbow colors or dress up as something other than their usual gender preference. But one Christian student didn't feel comfortable dressing up, and so her mother called the school to see what other options the family had. Well, the school counselor asked the mother, well, you don't want your child to be an intolerant bigot, do you? Well, if you're a Christian, the world will hate you. You'll be accused of being judgmental and narrow-minded. Family will tell you that you've left your brain at the door. Friends will badmouth you. Work colleagues will mock you for your faith. You'll be accused of being intolerant. You, know, you Christians disapprove of sex. You're homophobic. You try to push your morals on the rest of society. You're intolerant of other beliefs. You hate women. And even if we're not facing a backlash directly, well, our culture will always be trying to move us away from God. Our modern temples, our sports stadiums, and our shopping centers. Our sport and leisure are a religion in South Africa. Stadiums are packed out with supporters chanting on their favorite teams. Schools demand worship of their sports teams. If you think that's an exaggeration, we'll just attend one of the local derby matches. Our local shopping centers are filled with everything that our heart desires and more. Shops will entice you with sales and advertising that feeds into our greed and our coveting and our materialism. We constantly want more. Satisfaction is found in retail therapy. And being a Christian isn't easy. It requires patient endurance. And so the Ephesian Christians are commended for working hard, for patiently enduring, and then finally for right doctrine. Well, Irenaeus was a bishop in the early church. He wrote a book called Against Heresies. In the book, he quotes another bishop, Polycarp, who tells a story about John. Well, John spent a number of years in Ephesus, and one day he went to bathe at the public baths. Inside was Cerinthus, a heretic. Polycarp claimed that John, seeing Cerinthus inside, rushed out of the bathhouse without bathing, exclaiming, Let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Cerinthus, the enemy of truth, is within. Well, it seems that the church in Ephesus had been taught well. They were doctrinally sound. So St. Stephen's is part of REACH South Africa. Well, let's test your knowledge. REACH is an acronym. So what do each of the letters stand for? What does the R stand for? Reform. Reform. Ah, good. Yeah, the E? Evangelical. The A? And, yeah, and the CH? Church. Good, you guys are good. Good. Now, I only want us to think about the E. Okay, Evangelical. Okay, that means that we believe the Bible to be true. And the fancy terms for that are inerrant and infallible, which means that the word of God is without error and absolutely trustworthy. That's why we call ourselves, St. Stephen's, Bible Church. Yeah, we put the Bible at the center of all that we do. And when society tells us it's okay to murder unborn babies or to sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or that there are multiple genders or numerous paths to God, but we don't just accept it. We test those statements against what God teaches us in his word. And if the Bible disagrees with our culture, well, we follow the Bible. Now, sometimes false teachers will be inside the church. We're not sure what the Nicolaitans were teaching, but clearly it wasn't the gospel. And Jesus has strong words for them. He hates their works. Or well, do we hate the works of liberal theology? Well, those who say that they want to make Christianity relevant, but in so doing dispense with the Bible. The very thing that makes our faith relevant. Now, if the Bible isn't the word of God, if it isn't trustworthy, well, why should we care what it says? We don't listen to those whose morals are based on the culture of the day rather than on God's unchanging word. Do we hate the works of the prosperity preachers? We should. It's a false gospel. It preaches that God wants Christians to be physically healthy, materially wealthy, and personally happy. Well, there are plenty of prosperity gospel preachers out there. One of them is Gloria Copeland. 
Let me read you the blurb from her book. God's will is prosperity. That title should already have your false teacher, the false, false teacher sensor on high alert. Listen to this drivel. <clears throat> In God's will is prosperity. You will discover the undeniable scriptural basis for God blessing his people and the keys to receiving all he has laid up for you. Scripture clearly establishes how intensely God desires to display his goodness and love toward mankind by pouring out his prosperity and abundance. From the beginning of time, he has provided financial prosperity for his people through obedience to his word. The question is, how willing are you to let him display that goodness through you? If you're a believer, you have a covenant right to prosperity. Jesus bore the curse of poverty at the same time he bore sickness and the rest of the curse. God's will is to establish his covenant of prosperity in your life today. So begin to believe and act on his word and discover for yourself that God's will is prosperity. Well, if you own that book, burn it. <laughs> Have nothing to do with false teachers. Always test what someone says against the Bible. Now, things sound pretty positive for the church at Ephesus. If you're a member of the Ephesian church, you'd be you know, feeling pretty good right about now. But although they work hard, patiently endure, and are doctrinally sound, well, they have one major flaw. Jesus rebukes them for abandoning their first love. Well, this is the love that they have for Jesus, but probably also the love that they actually have for other people as well. well. The Ephesian church have fallen into a trap we must be careful to avoid. Well, Ephesus is a loveless church. Jerome was a famous theologian who lived in the 4th century. In his commentary on Galatians, he tells this story about John. Well, John was old and frail and unable to walk, and so his disciples would carry him in to the weekly meetings. Every time he would simply say, little children, love one another. You'd like that sermon every week, huh? One sentence. <laughs> little children, Love one another. Well, this went on week after week until at last, weary of these repeated words, his disciples asked him, Master, why do you always say this? Because, John replied, it is the Lord's command. And if this only is it done, it is enough. We have no way of verifying Jerome's story, but it certainly sounds like John. His writings are filled with appeals to love. Here are two of them. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Well, the Ephesians were conscientious, but they served out of a sense of duty and not out of a love for Jesus. They had programs without passion. They were a busy church who held fast to the truth, but a church drifting away from heartfelt devotion to Jesus. Now, we should work hard. We should be intolerant of false teachers. We should be strong on doctrine. But if we don't combine that with a love for Jesus and for others, well, then we will just appear intolerant and judgmental and unloving. When we hate the sinner rather than the sin, well, we aren't showing the love of Jesus. And we need to repent of that kind of thinking. Well, there's some things that we need to repent of tonight. Has something other than Jesus taken priority in our hearts? Has our love for him grown cold? Well, we need to repent. Admit that we've grown distant and fall head over heels in love with Jesus again. Well, Jesus tells the Ephesians that they simply do not love him like they used to. It would break our hearts if our spouse said that to us. And when you were dating, you'd open the car door for her, pull her chair out at restaurants, buy her flowers for no reason. She'd hold your hand, write little notes with hearts and kisses all over them. You'd call each other silly names, go on dates together, say I love you often, phone each other all the time. Well, those things shouldn't stop when you're married. <laughs> When the honeymoon phase is over, don't let things slide. Don't take each other for granted. Keep on loving each other and doing all the things, the little things and the big things that you did when you first met. And if that's true for our marriages, 
then how much more for our relationship with Jesus? Would it bother us if we knew that Jesus felt this way? That we'd abandoned our love. And so we need to remember. Some of us have been saved so long that we've lost the thrill of those early days. Can you remember what it was like when you first came to Jesus and the weight of your sin was lifted from your shoulders? Can you remember how you wanted to tell everyone you knew about Jesus and all that he'd done for you? Can you remember how passionate you were about reading your Bible? You were like a sponge that wanted to soak up every single ounce of truth. Can you remember when you first understood grace? When you fully grasped all that Jesus has done for us on the cross? Can you remember long conversations with God as you spent time with him in prayer? Can you remember? Well, take a few seconds and reflect on, on how it used to be. Do that now. Now think about how it presently is. Can you honestly say that you're still in love with Jesus today? If not, we'll repent. Jesus will forgive us. Because if we don't, well then Jesus has some of the harshest words in all the Bible to say to us. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. We'll have some pictures for us of the um, Ephesian church for us today. Well, actually, I don't, because there is no church at Ephesus. It's just ruins. That's all that remains. Jesus removed their lampstand. It's a somber warning for us, too. If our love for Jesus and for others grows cold, it doesn't matter how many people attend on a Sunday, how many events we put on, or how doctrinally sound We strive to be. Jesus will take away our lampstand. Well, Jesus summed up the whole of the law as love God, love your neighbor. Everything that we do and think and are should flow out of that. And then if we do that, well, then Jesus has a marvelous promise for us. To the one who conquers, he'll grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray. Almighty God, help us to keep working hard for you, to patiently endure, and to uphold your truth. But if the reason we do all this isn't because of love for you and for others, may we repent. Help us to remember our first love, so that our lampstand won't be removed, but that we would eat from the tree of life in your eternal presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.